what I'm going to talk about now is about youth policy. And uh, basically, uh, I think there are three elements that has to be in their place uh, to reach a good youth policy. One is that you had to have a shared set of objectives. Youth rights, for example. Secondly, you had to have somebody responsible for that process. You had to have structures and you had to have resources. And of course, thirdly, you had to have uh, activities and programs to carry all this out in the practice. So roughly in my presentation, I'm looking through all these levels. And I will start by the uh, potential shared objectives and youth rights. Now, uh, in, the, in Europe, we are fortunate in the sense that we have a lot of international organizations, intergovernmental organizations, where our governments have agreed on certain youth policy objectives uh, or rights uh, for young people. And of course, I would say that one of the most influential and important is the United Nations Conventions, uh, Convention uh, for the Rights of the Child, often shortly uh, abbreviated as CRC. And uh, particularly the uh, Article 12 in that convention, which uh, uh, outlines very clearly uh, uh, the right of the child or the children uh, to be heard in matters that concern uh, him or her is uh, the most important uh, one of them and has had a strong influence in the uh, national and international uh, uh, objective setting in that area. So uh, it was uh, interesting to hear at the poll that uh, at least in this, this room there are a lot of people who would be uh, proponents for the USA also to adopt this convention and it's my strong feeling based on my experience that that might be a very good thing for your uh, for the development of youth work and youth policy in your country as well. We uh, also have two other important organizations in Europe. It's the Council of Europe which is the organization of 47 countries it's basically a human rights organization uh, which has very strong youth structures. Well, that's my uh, former job. And uh, it's uh, located in Strasbourg. Uh, it has, its decision-making bodies has uh, issued a large number of uh, declarations, uh, recommendations, even conventions uh, in the field of, of youth. And uh, there is also a recent uh, declaration of the European Minister Responsible for Youth uh, Future Plan for the Youth Field. And all those documents are, are I find, uh, important guidelining uh, papers. Then we have the European Union, which is the economic and social uh, intergovernmental uh, body, uh, which uh, favors free market, free exchange of uh, ideas, people, goods in Europe. And uh, it also has uh, pronounced itself in youth policy through a white paper and a very recent youth strategy. I will talk to you quite soon a little bit more in concrete about this quite new youth strategy. The European Union is placed in Brussels. Now, I give this all this background because I know that uh, normally people outside Europe uh, don't know much about Europe and particularly about their uh, international organizations. Uh, in fact, w I just met one of my colleagues from Council of Europe, a uh, Russian uh, girl, who told that um, she sent a letter, some information to her colleague in Hong Kong and finished the email saying that uh, greetings from Brussels and she got back an email blah 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 finishing with the words is Brussels the name of your new boyfriend <laughs> so uh, we don't expect people outside of Europe to be so knowledgeable about what is Europe and what's happening there 
anyway, here I have you uh, kind of a short version which uh, tries to uh, take up the key elements that you find in these uh, various youth uh, policy objectives. And as you can see, youth participation is one of the key items there. Uh, it's also uh, the item of improving and developing uh, non-formal learning, which we'll be discussing today also. It's also about uh, uh, inclusion of all young people, and it's also about uh, supporting cultural diversity, tolerance, and integration of eth ethnic youth, which uh, in Europe and its big cities is uh, quite a big issue today. Now, I thought that uh, <clears throat> to give a little bit better insight about uh, the youth policy thinking in Europe, we have a very recent uh, youth strategy uh, issued by the European Union. It, it was publicized last week, so it's a pretty uh, fresh document. And it's a long-term plan for the youth field. Uh, it covers actually nine years. Uh, quite ambitious effort today to cover, to plan your life for a nine-year span. But, uh, okay, uh, the key, the tag words in this plan are investing and empowering. And the strategy is divided under three broad objectives. It's uh, uh, improving the education and employment integration of young people. It's about the youth participation. And it's about uh, supporting youth at risk. But let's have a little bit more uh, concrete look. What do those general objectives then include? I've picked up only some of them just to highlight the interesting things. Now, actually, before going into detail, I, I perhaps would like to mention that uh, uh, the way this document has been prepared is not, uh, it's not written by some um, bureaucrats in Brussels. It's a result of a long process, which is called Open Method of Coordination, OMC for short in Europe. And it works so that uh, um, uh, the Brussels sends to the member countries uh, the task that all member countries should discuss among themselves uh, certain youth policy themes. And then the me member countries take quite a trouble to really think over uh, the key youth policy issues in their country. And in Brussels, they are brought together and actually they uh, appear now in this strategy. So it's a process of uh, consulting uh, all the 27 member countries plus youth organizations and other interest groups. So it, it reflects uh, the voice of Europe in terms of youth policy. Of course, as it's a document for everybody, it in this form uh, lacks and loses some of its uh, concreteness and uh, innovation and all that stuff. So. People like me who have read too much international documents, uh, it probably is not that exciting. But it has, I think, interesting elements. And if you look at the first general objective, which, which was about education and employment, there is uh, the most important uh, kind of a target or objective, sub-objective, is really to promote uh, non-formal learning. And there is, I think, a clear message in a sense that, uh, according to the opinion of European Union, uh, non-formal learning should really be an integral part of lifelong learning. So it's a recognized part of the learning uh, task of uh, citizens in the EU countries, which I think uh, gives good potential to, to uh, make non-formal learning more transparent and better recognized. And it also clearly says that it should be supported. And also, uh, it gives a few guidelines of how it should be developed. And uh, here it says that one of the ways that it should be developed is developing its quality. So this sounds familiar. Uh, we have been here uh, in Minnesota uh, 
doing a lot in that area. Well, a week ago we had Charles Smith here talking about the latest development of youth quality assessment uh, tools. And uh, so that's, that's an example of the similarities of developmental ideas that we have. And then again, there is this uh, idea of integrating it better with the formal education, which uh, isn't anywhere concretely said what it does in the end actually and concretely mean. But that's something that we should perhaps discuss uh, later on. And as we found in some of your answers to the questionnaires, uh, there were many people who uh, wasn't sure about what, do, what would it mean to become integrated with the formal education. So there, I think, is a lot of things to be discussed uh, before we just go on with it. Uh, then it was the second general objective on uh, youth participation. And there uh, we can find one interesting uh, additional uh, element, which is that the strategy says that we should invest more in young people's health and that uh, in the future youth workers should uh, collaborate more with health professionals, with sports organizations, uh, which means that uh, health has become one of the key youth policy issues uh, in Europe, and it probably is that also here. And uh, it also points out to uh, collaboration uh, partners, which we uh, haven't probably not uh, haven't been using uh, in the past too much. So there are new challenges for us. Then again, it's the participation uh, message, which comes very strongly through in this strategy too. And uh, there are also some guidelines on how should we then go on developing the youth participation issue. And in the European scene, very much is put on the idea of supporting young people's own organizations. That means organizations which are manned and managed and run by young people themselves and, and where 80% uh, of the uh, members are at least uh, young people. So there's a big faith in young people themselves uh, to promote youth participation. And again, we find uh, the quality issue, developing quality standards for youth participation and also uh, looking at ways to better use uh, the internet uh, in this respect. Then the third element in this EU strategy looked at the youth at risk policies where uh, there seemed to come up the issue of intergenerational continuity of youth issues and the need to uh, the need for uh, multi-agency, cross-sectoral uh, uh, teams and working groups and efforts to try to solve that issue. Also, volunteering uh, is becoming more important in the uh, European uh, youth work. Um, now, we have a lot of documents, a big pile of documents uh, from the international organizations to outline uh, the basic objectives, objectives, the rights of children and young people and all that. But the question is, uh, what do we do with these nicely worded documents? Do they in any way trickle down to the national level or the local level? Or are they just uh, um, documents in the shelves of ambassadors, foreign ministries, and so on. What do they mean to us? And when we had in the poll the question of does the potential adoption of the uh, uh, Convention of the Rights of the Child, uh, what is its potential effect to the local level? Many people were hesitant whether it has any effect here. So let's look at how uh, these international commitments of our governments uh, then how do they possibly uh, affect the local level? And it's absolutely sure that we should need at least the governments 
between the international organizations and local levels to function as an intermediary. I mean, I can use the uh, uh, CRC back at Helsinki to say that it's important to uh, support youth participation because we have signed the, this convention in the EU and that's it. But it's better to be in a straight line from international organizations, uh, uh, government policies and then the local level. Now, let's uh, look at how this works in the case of Finland. We have a recent uh, youth legislation. It's called the Finnish Youth Act, uh, adopted a few years ago. And uh, now, this act says some interesting things. First of all, it says that the government shall adopt a youth policy development program uh, every four years. So it means that the government uh, steps on youth issues. It wants uh, all the ministries and the uh, agents in the youth field to come together, draft a four-year plan, and report back. So that's a strong uh, statement from the government side to do something about the youth affairs. And uh, it also gives uh, uh, good background and uh, inspiration for the local level to do something uh, like that in the local level. Uh, another thing is that the Act also says that it states that uh, youth work and youth policy are part of the local authorities' responsibilities. So it says that in every municipality or city there must be somebody who is responsible for organizing uh, youth uh, activities, youth policies. Uh, in the case of Helsinki, for example, uh, it's uh, the youth department and me. Uh, I'm not directly, re directly responsible to the government because uh, my budget comes from the city council, so I'm responsible for the city council, and city council is the kind of a uh, juridical body which is responsible to the government. Uh, thirdly, it also outlines activities and services for young people which should be on place, which I, for example, am responsible for the city council and the government. And uh, there are a number of very different kinds of uh, services that the children actually have, because of this law, the right to expect from the uh, local cities. So, a young person has the right to expect that the city organizes uh, them a good youth information and counseling service. And if you run an organization, you have the right to get support from the city, because that's how the law says it. And it's the responsibility of the city council and the kind of a body that the city council has nominated to take that responsibility on. Um, not, sorry, not uh, all countries have such a strong legislation as we have in Finland. Uh, somebody has said that, some of my colleagues have said that uh, you guys in Finland have the best youth law in, 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 in the world. Well, I don't know about that, but it, it's, it's, uh, it's new and, and it's uh, uh, very clear on uh, outlining objectives which go very much in the line of the uh, CRC, the European uh, Insti Institutions uh, Youth Policies. It outlines responsibilities to the government, to the ministries, to the local level. It also creates structures to, to implement that. Um, but uh, as not all countries have these kind of uh, uh, strong uh, intermediary, intermediary structures, there could be other possibilities. And one of the possibilities that uh, the Council of Europe has come to is an idea of a minimum, a minimum package of opportunities and experiences, which simply means that uh, a government or a city can outline a number of services which it thinks that it's young people uh, deserve, and then expect someone to be responsible for those services, kind of a minimum set of services. Here you have an example of a list of those services. That list is already quite ambitious and covering, so it's rather 
here for, uh, as, as an example. I have also in another slide an example uh, of uh, Finnish Ministry of Education uh, outlining also this type, same type of list of a package of opportunities for a minimum package of opportunities and experiences for the local level, which gives in a more kind of a concrete way, uh, it outlines the services that the young people should have the right uh, to have an access to. Um, now, uh, going further on how can then these uh, uh, international objectives, youth rights, uh, national legislation be implemented. I know that laws in itself doesn't mean anything. We have, for example, experiences from the uh, post-Soviet countries which uh, after the liberation from Russia uh, copied a number of uh, Western laws in various fields. And they were excellent laws, but they didn't lead anywhere because they didn't have the structures to implement them in many cases, nor uh, the resources to do it. So it's not enough to have a good uh, legislation, good objectives. You also need to have the structures to implement them. And now I will give a look at uh, uh, how this is organized uh, in Europe, in Finland. In the case of Finland, we have a Ministry of Education. Under the Ministry of Education, we have two ministers. We have uh, youth, sports, culture, and uh, uh, formal education. And we have a minist minister which is responsible for youth, sports, and culture. So when this minister co goes to um, ministerial conferences on youth, he's titled uh, Stefan Wallin, the minister responsible for youth. So we have, in that sense, a minister responsible for youth affairs. Um, in the ministry, there's likewise a department responsible for youth affairs. We also have an, something called Advisory Council for Youth Affairs, which is a consultative body, body annexed to the uh, Ministry of Education and the Youth Department, which is comprised of representatives from uh, youth organizations, uh, uh, researchers, uh, youth workers, um, which have uh, quite a lot of functions too. Then, if you go down to the local level, uh, for example, in the case of Helsinki, we have a youth department at the city, which means that, uh, uh, for example, me being the head of the youth affairs, my colleagues would be the heads of education department, health department, and uh, social department. So I'm, in a way, in the inner circle of the city administration, and I have the access uh, to pronounce myself on youth issues and affairs and to promote uh, cooperation in that field. And uh, uh, that's kind of important. Then if you go on to look at some other structure that we have also is those structures uh, which lobby uh, the youth voice, so to say. So on the national level, we have a body called Alliance which is an umbrella organization for uh, more than 100 national youth organizations. Uh, it's sometimes called National Youth Council. Now, this body uh, actually is it's supported heavily by the uh, Ministry of Education and the Youth Department. It's a very powerful political lobby organization. It does have an effect if it wants to legislation, to the decisions of government, if something comes up in the youth field, they can simply phone the prime minister and, and the afternoon they are sitting with the prime minister and, and, and telling what's the view of young people on this and that uh, affair. They are very good at that stuff. Um, uh, the national youth councils, which exist practically in all European countries, are linked on a European level. And that umbrella organization is called European Youth Forum. Surprise, surprise, it has its headquarters in Brussels. And it is indeed linked closely to EU decision-making bodies. So the EU, if EU is deciding something that relates to youth, the European Youth Forum will be there. It has established a kind of a consultative status in the EU structures. And uh, in the Council of Europe, 
uh, it goes even further. It uh, takes decision on Council of Europe youth department budget on equal footing with the government representatives. Um, so they can have their say. On the local level in the Helsinki, we have also an umbrella organization of those youth organizations that are operational at the city of Helsinki, kind of a local organizations. They are called the Helsinki team. And they also uh, are quite eager to pronounce themselves on matters, uh, especially uh, relevant to youth organizations. Uh, and then we have other forms of youth participation. So, uh, as you can see in this picture, we have two types of structures uh, to, to see to it that, uh, the, that we have youth policy. And one is uh, the, the youth structures on all levels of the, pub uh, of the public administration, and we have the public administration and political structures, uh, the ministries, the youth departments, and so on. And sometimes these two structures, they even cooperate, not uh, necessarily, but in many cases they do, and they form quite a powerful uh, power coalition together. So I think this is uh, also important to know. Um, now, uh, to go on, uh, to kind of uh, leave back the objectives and rights and the policy documents and the structures and all that, and go uh, move over to the actual activities and programs. I'd like to give you some uh, ideas on how we organize that. Uh, but I would perhaps, as I am being talking so much about non-formal learning, and it probably is not very self-evident what does that mean, so maybe I just give you a short definition to, to start with. Uh, this is kind of a, the shortest possible version of uh, saying what are the typical characteristics of formal education, non-formal education, and, or non-formal learning, and informal learning. Now, as you can see, formal education is the institution-based structure, structured, hierarchically organized, teacher-centered education, uh, building on the idea of objective knowledge, uh, memorizing, certification, and so on. Informal learning then uh, could refer to all that type of learning that we learn in our everyday life and context, whether that's the family, whether that's uh, school, schoolyard, whether that's uh, the community programs, whether that's uh, being in a rock concert or in other youth uh, culture event, whatever people learn uh, all the time, uh, even if it might not necessarily be conscious, and even if it doesn't aim at uh, certification. And somehow the idea is that non-formal learning is something which is in between these two types of learning, uh, between the formal, highly structured formal education and then the non-structured, spontaneous daily learning. And I think I read this out because I've had quite a trouble in putting all these words together to really describe what it could be. So non-formal learning is a learner-centered and practice-based learning process which emphasizes intrinsic motivation, social context of learning, and the usefulness of knowledge and aims at identity growth, social change, and integration into society. Learning is voluntary, involves conscious educational aims, and may be credited. So I don't know if you uh, can live with this def definition and that may be uh, one thing to perhaps discuss uh, among others. And I know that these different uh, learning types also interrelate. In the end, in practical life, it's difficult to make such uh, clear demarcation lines, but maybe this uh, definition uh, helps perhaps understand what we are meaning when we are talking about non-formal learning. Um, and clearly, wherever you look, for example, in the policy document, which we saw, non-formal learning is uh, uh, experiencing a boom. Um, coming back again to uh, the European Union documents, uh, uh, recently the European Union has outlined 
what would be the key competencies of its citizens. And it outlines eight competencies. And it, perhaps it's interesting to see that uh, the first three competencies are those which you typically learn in or through formal education, while uh, the rest of them, the five rest of them, are those types of competencies which you very often and also perhaps uh, in the best way learn in various uh, non-formal learning contexts. So in this sense, uh, you can also see the increasing uh, appreciation and interest in the non-formal learning uh, contexts and the competencies and skills learned through that type of learning approach. The European Union has tried to also invent, invent kind of a tools to link formal and non-formal learning to each other. One is called uh, Youth Pass, uh, which is a kind of a study book where you can put, uh, uh, if you, for example, this example comes from uh, youth exchanges, which uh, the European Union uh, promotes very strongly. And uh, in these youth exchange programs, young people, of course, learn a lot of competencies. And the idea is to actually make them transparent and have them recognized through putting them into this uh, document called the Youth Pass. And then the idea is to lobby this document uh, as a serious paper describing what you know uh, and what kind of competencies you have achieved. Um, now to go back to the local level and take as an example the uh, youth services at the city of Helsinki. Um, we, our objectives are well uh, lined up with the objectives of the uh, government legislation. It's well lined up with the international uh, objective setting. And uh, we do have a structure and we do have uh, quite good resources. We have a uh, regionally covering network of youth centers experienced by the citizens to be a uh, basic service in the community and then a number of other types of more uh, specialized uh, centers and services. We support youth organizations uh, amply, I would say, and we have uh, quite a lot of professional youth, works, youth, youth workers employed. We have many types and kinds of uh, youth centers. We organize different kinds of activities, mainly young people's own cultural activities, hip hop, rock uh, contests uh, for amateur bands, uh, things like that. We there, and we are also working, of course, with the hip hop scene. And uh, this is a picture taken from a skate park that was uh, designed and uh, uh, also built by young people themselves with the help of the youth workers. Uh, there is something that we cannot compete, where we cannot compete with the local four-age uh, organization here in Minnesota. But we do have a domestic animal farm in our services because we have realized that uh, young people eat pork nearly daily, but they have never seen a live pig. So we thought it wouldn't be such a bad, bad idea to show them uh, living uh, domestic animals. But we have something that the uh, forage here in Minnesota does not have. And that is a transportable floating sauna. <laughs> it's here uh, uh, parked on one of our camping islands uh, on, on the seaside. OK, uh, then some other strange things, facilities that we have is, one that we have is a virtual youth center, uh, which was established because we found out that young people spend so much time in the net. So we thought we had to have a service there. We had to have a youth center there. 
and now we have done that uh, at one of the most popular sites uh, with young people, which means it's a private uh, website called Hebbo. You have it here in the USA. If you have 10 to 15 year old kids, they probably are there at the moment because during the last 30 days there have been uh, 8 million visits to these sites uh, as I looked that up. And, but we in Finland, we have a, a municipal uh, youth center uh, at that same place. And we have uh, youth workers there live who are there to discuss with the young people in this center. We take 20 people at a time inside so that we can have meaningful discussions with the young people. And as you can see, there is a queue outside. Not much, but there is a queue. There are two people queuing there. Normally there is a bigger queue. That's actually the only youth center that has queues outside its doors. It's become very popular and we are extending the opening hours. Uh, partly because we have been able, as it's a uh, service in the net, we have been able to uh, uh, find uh, partnerships with other municipalities, other youth workers around, the, around Finland. So the uh, stars there signify uh, cities which have youth workers in this virtual youth center. So now we have uh, extended the opening hours. And uh, it's interesting. Uh, we make statistics there the same way we make statistics in, in our uh, kind of a uh, uh, real life uh, context. We measure uh, the, uh, the number of visitors, we measure uh, the number of those uh, young people with whom uh, the youth workers have become uh, acquainted, know their names and something about them. And we um, uh, uh, also notify uh, the number of those young people who we have actually helped and, and given a longer term uh, kind of a survival advice and planning uh, on, on their lives. So in our understanding in the internet uh, you can do the same things with young people as you can do in the real life which was a bit of a surprise for ourselves too. Um, so now we, we are developing that and other means to work with young people in the net. And the recent trend has been that we have been uh, added by uh, three, uh, no, four uh, health workers from the health department of the city to work with our youth workers uh, to meet the kids in the internet. And we will get one uh, social worker pretty soon. And we already have our street workers using part of their time uh, in the streets of the internet, also in the real life streets. And uh, we have some experience, good experience about working with the police who is also eager to be there in our youth centers and youth facilities to meet the young people. So it's, it's a service that we are proud of. Actually, we got last December the uh, price of the most innovative service in the city from the mayor and uh, encouraged by that, we applied the United Nations Public Services Award for this year. And we uh, passed two rounds of elimination. But unfortunately, last week, I got a message from New York saying that we didn't make further than the finals. But I mean, we are pretty satisfied with that too. So uh, it's very many things that happen in the youth field. Now, uh, how many? Okay, good. Okay, um, some uh, uh, ideas about uh, about youth participation. Now, this uh, uh, youth law I mentioned to you, it has something like Section Eight, which uh, says that young people's which, says, which is about young people's participation. It says that young people must be given opportunities to take part in the handling of matters concerning local and regional youth work and youth policy, which then means everything, I guess. Further, young people shall be heard in matters concerning them. So this is a very binding statement and, and, and it's uh, good to learn. Uh, uh, if you want to look at the Finnish law, as an example, it can be reached from uh, 
Well, uh, when I have been going around the meetings, uh, uh, Byron has always accompanied with me, and he has always taken copies of the Finnish work, uh, legislation and de delivered them and saying, read this, it's all there. And uh, so, in principle, you have two ways of uh, getting hand of this document. One is to go to, the, uh, to this website where the English version of it can be downloaded. The other is to call up Byron and he'll make copies for you. Okay, so how we implement this strong uh, uh, chapter section on youth policy? We provide a large number of uh, participation opportunities for young people at the city of Helsinki. Uh, I can't go through them all. I just shortly go through one of them, which uh, I think uh, describes very well what it is all about. And it's, it's about the Lord Mayor's youth meeting. I think I made a reference to this uh, two years ago when I was here, but uh, it's worth uh, repeating for those who already were here. So uh, here, uh, the starting point is that the education department has a sum about a million euros, which is yearly used for different kinds of renovation of the boot school building, uh, improving uh, facilities and, and, and so on, uh, used by a certain civil servant uh, specialized in that type of activities. Now we did the decision that we took this money off this uh, civil servant and gave it for the young people to decide on. And then we run, we run yearly uh, this uh, procedure which starts with all schools at and all classes at all schools at the city of Helsinki. So it covers all young people. And each school, the young people are brainstorming on how could we improve the school environment, how could we improve the school atmosphere. So it's a broad uh, area of things that could be thought of. And then the young people brainstorm it, they argue about the possibilities, and they finally maybe vote and decide on what is the proposal of each class. Then this proposal of the class goes to the school council where we repeat this uh, procedure and finally they come up with a proposal of the school. And then people from uh, two representatives of each school gather in the city hall in the city council meeting room where the mayors, uh, one mayor at a time, uh, presides the meeting and the young people make the presentations, uh, they discuss about it and finally they uh, cast their vote pushing the red or green button. And uh, this uh, exercise has a number of, of uh, good implications. First of all, uh, the most important thing is that they are not being only consulted. They are using real power because they have money, million euros to be used. So that's real participation. Secondly, <coughs> it's a good school <coughs> for It's a good school for democracy. The young people learn, learn the key democratic skills. They know how to brainstorm ideas, how to listen to others, how to debate argumentation skills, uh, how to vote. And finally, they even get to know how the city council uh, works. So it's a school of democracy. And then it also uh, improves the young people's impression that they can have a say at this city, which is an important uh, way to increase their uh, trust in a public uh, authority or, or, or a thing like a city. And uh, it also gets a lot of media attention so that it, it's, it's also good publicity for the cause. Um, now, uh, I think I won't go into this, but another uh, solution in the Finland has been to elect in school elections a youth council, which then um, is placed in the mayor's office or where the youth department is. And what these uh, youth councils or, or youth parliaments do is two things. They launch initiatives. I've listed some of the initiatives of, uh, of the youth council of my, of my neighboring city. And uh, they organize events. They have a small budget to attend. And uh, we do not have good academic independent research 
uh, on how this has been actually, how functional this has been and how young, young people have experienced this. But it seems that some, some uh, municipalities, particularly smaller municipalities, it seems to be working very well. Personally, I have some uh, doubts on it, but that's another story. Uh, just a few remarks on quality assessment as that has been a, a kind of a topical theme here in Minnesota and also in Europe. Uh, just give you an idea uh, how we assess our youth work. Um, we use different kind of tools. At the point of service level, we have developed uh, ourselves a tool uh, which is customized uh, to our needs. So when uh, Charles Smith talked here a week ago about uh, to, uh, quality assessment, he was uh, promoting a generic model, uh, kind of a, a general model enough to fit uh, into a variety of purposes. But uh, we have taken actually another way and we have thought that the generic model doesn't measure accurately enough uh, the uh, actual uh, youth work. So we have developed more customized tools, uh, for example, to evaluate uh, or assess the quality of youth center activities, camps, small group act activities, and youth participation. Uh, how we do it is mostly, not mostly, but very much also self-evaluation, where it has been a, a useful and well-received tool for the youth workers themselves. And we also know what we call external peer evaluation, which means that as we are running this tool, uh, we have developed it together with the neighboring countries, uh, neighboring uh, cities, uh, youth workers from uh, the neighboring city comes to our city, does the evaluation, and our youth workers go to the neighboring city and so on. So there is an element of uh, ex external uh, uh, point of view, but still the evaluators are youth workers, so, so they know what to evaluate. Uh, we are developing also a, a tool so that young people themselves could be evaluating. This was quite a debate in one of the groups I attended uh, last week, I know, kind of a subgroups uh, here uh, with Charles Smith, where we had an exchange of opinions about whether young people could be used evaluators, and, and we had kind of a, a heated debate about that. So that's something to discuss. Um, uh, then as to our entire department, the youth department, we use something like common assessment framework. The youth organizations, we have developed then a modification of, uh, of what we call EFQM, which is a very elaborate uh, quality assessment tool used by the private sector and big corporations and so on. But the youth organizations have now a model, a simplified model, which they use as uh, self-assessment. Uh, it seems to be uh, useful. Um, now I'm coming to my last slide, which is that I have been talking very much and maybe uh, in a enthusiastic voice about the importance of youth participation and putting the young people in, in, in the front and uh, pushing the real participation of young people. So I think uh, young people can be uh, looked uh, from the viewpoint of participation either kind of a very deeply and seriously and then in a more uh, uh, loose way only kind of a listening to the young people, uh, having some ideas about what young people do, and then uh, really to take the young people on board and give them power, even our power. And now uh, I thought that uh, the way we actually think of youth participation, do we really think it's something really important or is it not that important, affects the way that we run our entire youth policies. And I will take some examples. Uh, these are rather questions that uh, I am ready to reconsider if I'm wrong. But uh, um, uh, I have somehow the impression that uh, sometimes uh, the youth period is understood as a transitory period to adulthood. 
where the important thing is the adulthood and, and being young is also transitory, only transitory, it's only a means to an end, which is becoming an adult. And for example, this uh, uh, great idea of ready by 21, uh, which I very much appreciate, I mean the document and all the thinking, but, but the, uh, this kind of a mission statement, ready by 21, signals to me the fact that uh, before that uh, you are just on a preparatory phase. While very much in the European Sea we like to emphasize the fact that the uh, youth period is a phase or period of its own. It's not preparatory, it's not means, it's the end itself. And for example in the Swedish youth policies they promote very much not the integration of young people to become adult but to find ways of young people to help them stay young because they find it's very important phase in life as such. And this kind of a reflects back on the trust we have in young people and their participation. I may be wrong, I don't know. And, and, and another thing which I also find kind of a different from here is that here uh, the absolutely great youth work that you are doing is carried uh, very much by uh, uh, non-profit adult organizations. Sometimes young people in very much uh, kind of a leading role, but it's still the adult organizations. But the thinking in Europe and Finland is that it's the youth organizations that we should support. We should support them and let them themselves then decide on what the young people need and provide the services through that way. So this is kind of a, uh, I think, uh, a different way of thinking and maybe worth of uh, considering. I noticed from the poll that there were a lot of people who were ready to kind of a, perhaps move, shift, uh, perhaps to uh, look at the, this other direction too. Uh, then, well, uh, what kind of uh, participation formats you organize for young people? Uh, they could be tokenistic, they could be real participation. Uh, uh, it makes a difference whether you think young people basically as a problem or whether you think that uh, they have a certain knowledge of their own, in which case they are also the best resource to solve their uh, own issues. And which also then brings us back to how uh, the youth policies are allocated, how, what kind of interventions are emphasized, whether the emphasis is on uh, targeting youth at risk or whether it's in providing opportunities uh, as an early prevention for whatever young people. Now, this is actually what's I, what I had in mind and I'd just like to conclude saying that uh, the few weeks that I have been here, uh, I have felt kind of a déjà vu feeling. Going back to my own youth period, in the end of 60s, where there was a lot of enthusiasm to change the world. And I think I feel this same atmosphere here. You have a kind of a good attitude and, and real excitement uh, to have changes in, in, in your uh, kind of a youth work and youth policy uh, thinking. All this uh, work in the equality side uh, promoting youth uh, uh, system, uh, the uh, uh, complementary uh, after-school non-formal learning system uh, to, 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 to promote a, a number of initiatives, cooperation between research and all that. They are all kind of a converging, seem to be converging to one direction, which is uh, finding more transparency and recognition of the youth field in this country. And I wish you all the best in this path and I hope I gave you some uh, uh, food for thought on that. Thank you very much.